Um, I'd really like to welcome everybody here today, um, those attending to find out more about the Bachelor of Psychology and Counselling, and also the people, the teachers that are here, and Claudia that's here to um, help me out tonight and to help um, talk through the application part of tonight's session. I would also like to acknowledge the traditional owners um, on the land in which we are meeting. Um, we're probably uh, coming from a number of different lands potentially. Um, I know that I'm situated on the Wurundjeri um, Waiwurrung uh, lands. Um, I would like to pay respects to the elders, both past, present and emerging, along with the Aboriginal elders of other communities that might be here today. So tonight we've got a fairly tight program. Um, it's expected to run for just over an hour. Uh, we will be welcoming you and telling you a little bit about Ken Miller, but what I'd really love to do, and we'll see how this goes, it would be nice to put some questions out to you as well, the audience, to reflect upon and uh, that potentially also to comment on as well. Um, because I think that that makes a dialogue happen. And that's more in line with how we normally teach at Ken Miller. Rather than doing the didactic sort of presentation, we usually, um, we usually have people sitting around in, in kind of a, a circle. And uh, we certainly do use PowerPoints and we certainly do use class resources. But our real aim is to get conversations happening and from conversations we can bring what we're talking about to life. So tonight's a little bit different for me because we're using a webinar format. We will be going through the details to do with the Bachelor of Psychology and Counselling. Um, in particular, we'll be talking a little bit about the philosophy of the course and what's it what, it's, uh, what it covers and what it's like to study psychology and counselling. We will also then um, be going through applications and sort of the more, administ more administrative side of things. Claudia will be taking you through that. And we will have different parts of tonight where we will be talking about, um, where you'll be able to ask us questions. So I, I like to put this slide first up because this is our building. This is who we are. A lot of people um, kind of see Cam Miller as being where we were a few years ago, which was on Burke Road, and it was a lovely old stately mansion. Um, we moved to this premises about five years ago, and it's modern, it's light, it's airy, and we've got access to the whole building. So as you can see, it's quite a, a you know, a good sized building. Um, there's some um, beautiful aspects to the, to the campus. If you haven't already been on campus, um, towards the end of this, you'll see some pictures. And there's also a virtual tour that you might like to take in your own time. I just wanted to um, quickly sort of run through why choose Ken Miller? Um, there's a lot of other places that you could perhaps potentially look at studying at, although I, I must say that there aren't too many places that do a combined bachelor in counselling and psychology. So we'll be looking at that in more detail in a minute. But when we think of Ken Miller, Ken Miller has been around for 60 years in Melbourne. It's a bit of a Melbourne institution, certainly um, for the counselling and psychotherapy area. Um, it has changed a lot over that time. We're really proud um, of how we're doing in comparison with the other universities and indeed with other um, non-university higher education providers. Um, here are some statistics that, um, that came out uh, for the last 12 months that when we, um, when we look at innovative and inclusive process, 73.6 people, students, were positive about their interactions um, with other students and with staff, which is about 26 percentage points above the national average, and that's in comparison to universities and other non-university higher education providers. Um, when it comes down to student experience, we're about 81% 81, 81 of our students were positive over all of their experience. 
And when it comes to employment, we had 87% of our people found employment. Now that's not necessarily moving on to further study. And certainly we find that a lot of our students do move on to um, further study. So our stats in that regard are really good. And I think the, the very, the most recent hot off the press quilt study, um, which is the quality and learning and teaching study that the, these stats come from, had us in the top 10 for psychology teaching. And I know that counselling and psychotherapy um, has often been within the, the top echelons of the non-university um, providers as well. So we've got some very impressive stats and um, you can certainly look up the quilt study online and um, that that's published. So it's published and accessible to people if you'd like to check us out. So there are many reasons why students do choose Ken Miller. I'm not going to go through this in too much detail at the moment. But what one of the things that we really try to do is because we are smaller than the bigger universities, we really try to um, create a supportive uh, environment that supports you in your study and that's friendly and accessible, um, where it's just in a sense a little bit easier to navigate. Um, if you've, um, you know, if you think about some of the bigger universities, um, they've got a lot of really wonderful um, things going for them. But one of the wonderful things that Ken Miller has going for us is that we get to know you and you get to know us. And if you've got a problem, it's very easy to try and sort it out. We'll know who to see. And we all have open door policies and we're quite approachable. So that's something that we, um, we get a lot of positive feedback about, um, as well as the quality of our teaching and learning. So um, I'm not going to spend too much time on these slides because they basically provide a little bit of a pictorial of the first and second and in some cases the third year teaching staff and some of our teaching staff teach more than one unit but here are the lovely people that you'll be working with if you come and study with us. Um, they are friendly, approachable, um, wonderful educators and often they actually have their own private practice or are working in the field themselves. So, um, you know, or they may be researchers in the field. So we've got a lovely mix of practitioners, of researchers and in some cases specialists that, um, that come in and teach in a certain area that's specialised. So I'd like to now introduce you to some of our staff that are here on the panel, um, that are here, um, you know, just to introduce themselves. Um, let's see, I'm wondering whether maybe David, when I look at, um, at you're the first one <laughs> to my left, so I might start with you, David, would you like to introduce yourself? Thanks very much, Jenny. So. Good evening, everyone. My name is David. Um, I have a background in cognitive neuroscience. Basically, that's a fancy word for looking at psychology through neuroscientific measures. Anyhow, um, I am responsible for looking at a lot of the basic psychology subjects that you would otherwise be coming across. So, for example, in foundations of psychology, we look at uh, psychology as a discipline, its historical roots, its philosophical roots. Where did psychology come from? It's only been around for about 100 and say 40, 150 years. Um, you know, very basic principles such as, you know, what is cognition or what is thinking? What is consciousness? Uh, what is language? How does memory work? So we have a very broad overview of some very sort of key aspects that we talk about in psychology, uh, no matter whether it's clinical or educational or developmental or, or research. So that's something that we do from the start. And then in um, some subsequent subjects with me, you'd be looking at some more detail involving those things that we look at from a very broad point of view. So for example, in another unit, we look at cognitive psychology. So that's really focusing on trying to understand psychology as if our brains were computers. 
Uh, think of the brain as the hardware and psychological processes as the software. And so we look at a number of things using that particular approach. I think that's basically all I could really say at the moment. Otherwise, um, you know, myself and uh, other staff are extensively, you know, experienced in, in covering these issues. Um, uh, in many instances, have looked at these things um, over several years. Uh, I enjoy it thoroughly, getting to get students excited about psychology um, and, you know, they hopefully can see uh, their everyday lives in a, in a bit of a different um, manner. But anyhow, that's pretty much me for the, for the moment. Excellent. Thank you, David. That's a wonderful introduction. Um, David teaches a few units and um, he's extremely passionate. Um, which I think just is contagious. Um, I'd like to introduce Stefan. Stefan, um, Stefan's more, uh, Stefan, you're both a psychologist and a counsellor, aren't you? So you've kind yeah. of got both disciplines. Yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, so counsellor or, or a, a psychotherapist. Yeah, so um, I'm a clinical psychologist. I, I work at the Karen Miller Clinic as well. Um, and uh, I teach straight off the bat um, in the first year, first semester, we teach uh, counseling skills and we teach you how to say, uh, like what to say, but most importantly, we start teaching you how to be with another person that is considered helpful and that will be helpful for, uh, for your future clients. Um, and we go through a number of, uh, every week, it's very, uh, very heavily uh, centered towards skills. Um, so there's probably like 60, 70% skills building and then about an hour uh, every week could be a lecture. But we, we get you started and we, um, uh, every week we do start talking about, or you, you will have the experience of being a client as well as the, uh, the, uh, the counselor. And I'm hearing myself speak there's a never mind it's a little distracting um and so in the second semester i teach also ethics um which is really which i'm, I'm passionate about i've had great ethics uh, lectures and i'm willing uh, and I'm, I'm finding it really uh lovely to be able to pass on some of that passion uh onto the students too so that's me so that's for the first year uh Thanks for having me, Jenny. Thanks a lot. It might have been me. I don't think I was on mute. Sorry, I thought I was on mute, but I wasn't. Okay. Um, that's excellent. Thank you for that, Stefan. Um, what we do um, in, our, in, in our courses is we try to very much balance the two professional um, areas of counselling and psychology and we really focus on where they are similar and it's quite obvious in some ways how they will be different um, and that's a strength because in learning to be a counsellor you'll pick up on some strengths that aren't always foregrounded in your traditional psychology course and vice versa. Um, you'll pick up on some strengths from the counselling profession that aren't always foregrounded in, you know, a, a, you know, from, from a typical counselling course. So they are different professions. Um, I know I've worked across both professions. We've got a number of teachers who have worked across both professions. And then we've got some teachers that have worked very much as psychologists or and or as counsellors or psychotherapists. So we've got a lovely mix of teaching staff that draw from um, that sort of, I guess together it sort of creates an interdisciplinary knowledge. Um, and I might just take us back to the slides just to sort of look at that. But I'm just wondering at this point, um, were there any um, questions that people had for um, David or Stefan specifically? And if there is, just feel free to either um, put up, your, raise your hand or maybe to turn on your microphone. Maybe um, one thing I should have said at the start very cheekily 
Yeah. Is I can reassure everyone that um, um, contrary to what you may think when you're at a party and you talk to someone who's studying psychology, um, modern psychology is not necessarily, uh, shouldn't be making you think of Sigmund Freud with a cigar and, uh, um, and whatnot. Uh, modern psychology comes in many guises. Freud is one of them. Um, but I think that's part of what makes it so exciting. There are so many different ways of thinking about uh, the human mind, um, the human experience. And I think to, to really pick up on your point, Jenny, one of the things I really love about this course is the counselling and the psychology being two sides of the same coin. Um, and I know that from other courses I've been in where that hasn't really been um, the pitch, um, I'm appreciating more what this particular course can do um, for people who come in and get that exposure to two different but complementary ways of actually um, thinking about, you know, the human mind. Just wanted to get that in there. Thanks so much, David. Yeah. I'll go back to the slides now and just share them so that... Um, so you should be seeing that now, is that right? Yep. Um, I'm kind of interested too. I'm, what I'm going to do is I'll walk through the philosophy a little bit, but I'd be really interested too in, in what people um, want from a training program because that would be kind of setting up a little bit of a dialogue. I mean, essentially what we've been talking about just then is two professional practice models. One is known as the scientist practitioner model or the science practitioner model. And that is um, that kind of dominates traditional psychology courses. And then on the other hand, we've got the reflective practitioner model, which generally dominates um, the counselling or psychotherapy courses. And quite often these are seen as being separate, but I, I really feel that there's a lot of synergy there, that they actually come together because as a practitioner, you're going to be um, drawing from the reflective practitioner part, the part that um, really reflects on self, reflects on what you're doing, reflects on whether what you're doing is in alignment with what the client needs and wants and whether what you say you're doing is actually what you're doing. Um, and then on the other hand, we've got the science practitioner model, which uh, really looks at um, a sort of, I suppose, that critical thinking um, being able to um, weigh up the evidence, so being able to critically look at research, to be able to draw and use research in your work so that what you're doing has actually got an empirical base. Um, and, you know, as well as, so that's the evidence-informed practice. And then on the other side, we're also looking at what's happening in the here and now between me and the client. Um, can we utilise what's actually happening in the session to kind of inform, um, you know, how we practice? Um, so we're drawing evidence from a lot of different places. We're drawing ideas from what's happening in our practice as we work with people, as well as what the published literature states. We will be using skills of critical thinking, critical analysis, um, trying to um, evaluate uh, what is perhaps good, uh, good ways forward, as well as reflecting on ourselves and um, how, how we're doing with our client and how our client is, is finding the practice as well. And certainly um, one of the things that I think is common across both professions is very much um, seeking feedback from the client and being open to feedback. So these, so there's a lot of shared ground. And even when we look at the ground that seems to be different, when we really drill down into it, all of this is relevant towards becoming a good practitioner. And so what you're gonna to hear tonight is how do we make this come alive? How do we actually work to create the conditions so that you're getting knowledge about what evidence-informed practice is, what practice-based evidence is, what a science practitioner is and what a reflective practitioner is. Um, so there's, there's a few different areas there that we need to focus on. Um, 
I'm just going to check the next slide. And if I don't have it on the next slide, no, I may not. Let me just go into the next one yet. What I'm going to do is I'm actually going to ask a question for the group. Um, and this is more a reflective point that I'd like you just to think through. Um, so the reflective point that I'd love you to think through is along the lines of what are the kinds of things that you expect from an institution? What is it that you expect from an institution when you come on board and study with us or with, you know, with any institution? What are you looking for as a student? Um, because often we do come into a program expecting something. Um, and if you'd like to, you maybe could just pop that in the chat or, or maybe, um, you know, if you felt like that you wanted to talk about something, you might be able to um, raise your hand and we might be able to include, um, include a bit of a discussion, but there's no pressure for that. As I said, we would stop recording around this. And just as we're sort of thinking about what we might really like from, um, from an institution, it's also worth thinking about what are you hoping to get out of a course like this? What are some, if not career goals, but perhaps personal goals that you would um, like, to, uh, like to get out of a program like this? They're really points that I like to um, get people thinking about because I think it kind of focuses, um, it focuses your own thoughts on what it is, what the big picture is. Um, and what I can try and do is if I present what we can give you, then we can see whether it's a good match or not. Um, and as far as that second question, looking at what you'd like to achieve, it's along similar lines whether it's a good match, whether our course is actually a good match for what you're hoping to achieve. So further to the broad philosophy, we um, look at uh, what is our approach to teaching and learning. And we've really got three main pillars that um, inform what the Bachelor of Psychology and Counselling is about. We do focus on theory. Um, we look at ideas, we look at models of research, we look at um, the theories that inform our thinking. Um, as Stefan mentioned, there's also a practical component where we um, very much sort of are focused on um, putting, you know, putting things into practice. So um, actually applying the theory to um, a, you know, to a real life scenario. In the counselling um, units and in a number of the psychology units, the way in which we do this is that we will conduct what's called real plays, um, which is where we use our own material and we, we do like a role play, but it's not a made up role play. It's kind of based in, in what, um, where, where we might be using our own authentic material. And what we find is that that, that sometimes really, um, it, helps, uh, it helps us as the person that is uh, bringing in our own material because we get to see, oh, gee, did that work well for me or not so well? Um, and it helps the person who's learning the counselling skills because they also get a feel for what it's like to actually be sitting opposite somebody in an authentic situation. And so we're very heavy on practice. It may not necessarily always be real plays. It could be something else. But essentially, we're trying to bring the theory to life. We're also interested in a degree of personal work, which aligns itself with the reflective practitioner, but also very much, I think, in your work as potentially a psychologist. And this is where we're sort of looking at our, our levels of self-awareness, our um, ability to reflect, our openness to uncertainty and ambiguity. These are things that are very common and, and important to kind of um, be, uh, you know, getting used to in our training. Because when you work as either a psychologist or a counsellor, you often are working at the edges. You're often working, you know, in a space that 
is, you know, not always clear, but can be ambiguous or may not be always certain, but can be uncertain. And so being able to hold that space in that uncertainty is something that we really work with people. And that comes under this idea of, of kind of um, personal work, but also cultivating ethical um, ethical sensitive, uh, sensitivity and maturity. Um, I was about to make up a word there. Um, let's, Stefan, feel free to jump in if you have anything that you wish to add to what I'm saying as well. Just have a, um, a comment yeah. that was posted publicly, so I'll share. Okay. Um, uh, an attendee is interested uh, in subject slash discipline focus. I'm interested in this course for that reason. Practical skills are also important to me. Excellent. Yeah. Yep. And what this, just a quick note on that, um, what this course does tend to do, actually, I'm just going to stop sharing for a moment. Um, what this course does tend to do is it leaves your options open. So you don't have to make the decision before you enrol. You can make the decision during the course. And because some, let's face it, sometimes we don't know um, exactly which profession we might gel with. Um, and, and there are certain synergies in the profession, but there are certain departures as well, as I said before. And sometimes it isn't until you actually give it a try that you actually really realise that. Yeah, Stefan, did you have something to add into that? Yeah, with uh, real plays. Um, yeah, so we, we talk, um, we do it, what's really important is to establish safety. So, uh, and then we bring our own, by bringing our own material, what we mean is, we talk about the situations that are currently troubling us in our lives. Um, so then when something happens, say if somebody, if you're, if the student in the role of the therapist responds in a way that you find helpful, you feel it, it's immediately felt. And then we can talk about that and, and we debrief um, and uh, it's, you, feel, you feel a difference from the inside as well as learning stuff from the outside in a lecture, uh, but the skills-based stuff, you really feel uh, as the client and as a therapist, um, many things will come up for you as a therapist too. Um, and that's really important to talk about as well. Yeah. I've been talking about this for a long time. I'm 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 so passionate about this. So I think I, I should just stop myself free. <laughs> yeah. No, it's it's great, Stefan. And I'm glad that Stefan, you're gonna have to head off um a little bit later, and we're aware of that. David had to head off a little bit um earlier. Um, but um I really welcome your comments. So please, yeah, do do jump in. Um yeah, and that, you know, what Stefan just said links back to that reflective practitioner model. Um, but look, yeah, I, I think too, when we listen to the students that are going through the program at the moment, sometimes they come in with an idea. And then um, as far as which discipline they might be favouring, and then as the course proceeds, they sort of go through a period where they go, oh, I'm not really sure. And at least in this program, that's fine. You can just... Um, go with the ride and you've really got both options um, potentially open to you at the end. So let's have a little look at the program and the structure. Um, so we have um, two semesters. Sometimes you'll hear about um, institutions running on trimesters, we run on semesters, which means there are two main study periods in this course, semester one and semester two. Um, and you can see there, semester one runs from approximately February to around late May, June. And then there's a gap, there's a break in between the semesters that run from um, approximately the first or second week of June through to about the third week of July. And then we start second semester and we look at the um, July through to early November or end of October, early November. Um, each semester is 12 weeks, but what that does is it also includes, so it's 12 weeks plus two weeks. 
study break in the middle of um, of the semester. So I've just sort of drawn a diagram. There we go for six weeks. We have a, um, a teaching break is probably a more accurate term. And then we go from weeks um, seven to 12. Um, the study break is not really a break. It is a teaching break. Um, sometimes you may still be called into Ken Miller to actually um, work through things. For example, um, one group that we've had have just come back to um, to record their, you know, to do their presentations in um, for assessment. Um, that's in one unit, but generally it is a teaching break, and generally you don't you don't normally have to come back in to um, to the campus for those two weeks. Um, but during those two weeks, I wouldn't sort of start setting holidays. That's a trap that sometimes students get into. Um, I would suggest that you stay here and because um, it's a wonderful time to really focus on your assignments. Um, it just gives you that little bit of time to kind of catch up, consolidate and then start again for the second um, six weeks. It's a, it's a design that works really well, I think, and it particularly works well, I think, for people returning to study. Um, gives you that little bit of a breather before you go back in. And, and just while you're on that, uh, with the study break, it's, uh, it's two weeks long, which uh, when I was studying, I don't know how it is now, but when I was studying, we only got one week. Um, and, but more importantly, what I wanted to say is uh, we are available during that time. Uh, we're available, you know, not even during that time, but, you know, we're available throughout the whole semester, but especially during that time, uh, we're available to meet with students and to have uh, questions answered, you know, about assignments, about exams, about whatever's coming up ahead. Yeah, excellent. Um, thank you for that. That's true. We are. <laughs> Sometimes people say, well, what are you doing over the break? And I'm, I'm, I'm working. Yeah, yeah, we're, we're working just uh, <laughs> business as usual. <laughs> That's right, it is. Um, and, um, you know, if we look at this is another common question that comes up is how, how much time do I have to devote to full-time study and to part-time study? So full-time study is four units. So a unit is a subject. Um, so full-time study is four units per semester. So in a year, if you're studying full-time, you'll get through eight units. In a bachelor, there's 24 units all up, and that includes the placement unit. So each year, full-time, it's eight. So eight times three is 24. Um, each, um, each unit is, now this is a tricky bit, but I'll try and explain it. It's timetabled for three hours. And um, when we look at the counselling units, but it's not only, it's some of the psych units as well, um, they'll run for that full three hours. So for example, you're, you know, nine to 12 or one to four. That's typically when we schedule the classes, nine to 12, one to four. Um, we also try to, to put them on the same day. So if you're a full-time student, you'll be coming in two days a week. At the moment, it's Wednesday and Friday. If you're a part-time student, you'll be hopefully coming in one day a week. Now that's what I'm trying to do with the timetabling. But if any of you have ever done timetabling, it it's it's a nightmare so because you're not only just juggling teachers you're juggling rooms you're juggling everything else this year um and next year we've been able to keep it that way i'm hoping that in future we'll be doing that that's certainly where i'm i'm sort of um aiming for um now what's what sometimes what we mean by those timetabled hours is that in psychology, sometimes psychology does it a little bit differently in that they might upload the lecture online a few days earlier. And you can look at that lecture in your own time if you wish, or what we've been doing for this cohort is we've actually um, shown the recorded lecture in the actual room. And um, then we move straight into what's called a kind of a tutorial, which is how do we put what's in the lecture into into practice what do we actually do there now there's only a few subjects that do that and often the reason why we do that we change the recordings every single year so it isn't that we rehash recordings from previous years
but sometimes it, it just um, it works out better because we know our students are really busy and sometimes they might have a school drop off or something else and so it helps them but also it does help us sometimes to um, have that recorded because we actually worked that out during COVID that at times for some courses it was pretty heavy sort of theoretical stuff so why not give you the theory um, and we can break it up. So even while it's a recorded session, we break it up into smaller bite-sized chunks. But we get you doing that so that then we can play in the classroom. We can just, um, we can use that theory as a base to then leap off and be more experiential in the classroom. But we, we in any unit, as far as teaching goes, there are three hours of timetabled work. So if you get a recorded lecture, that might take up an hour or maybe an hour and a half, and then you'll come into class for an hour, for maybe two hours or an hour and a half to make up that three hours. Um, there is readings. We have an online um, management system through Canvas. That's our learning system. And we upload all the readings that you will need. You are welcome to go to our library and find other readings. We encourage that. But we do have some hand selected readings for every unit and you will be doing weekly reading. You need to allow approximately six hours per unit per semester for personal study. What that means is in addition to the three timetabled hours, we suggest on average approximately six hours of further study per unit. Now that may seem like a lot, but that includes reading and it also includes um, your preparation for assignments. It is an average. There may be some people that can do that a little bit quicker, more efficiently perhaps, and still get the value. Um, but we think that that's fairly realistic. So what that means is, um, you really are looking at a full-time workload if you choose to do full-time. And I think this is the biggest thing that um, not just in this program, but in other programs right across different institutions that I've worked, it's trying to work out, do I go full-time or part-time? What I'd be suggesting is that if you've got a job um, and if you've got family or other commitments, particular caring commitments, you might want to consider maybe two to three units. Two units is generally part time. Um, that would be probably where I'd be saying, because my experience is that if you have work, if you've got family and if you've got caring um, duties, full time can be pretty full on. You can change. So what you enrol in initially, you can change later. But remember that what you commit to after census day, and we'll be talking more about census day a little bit later, what you commit to for that semester. So after about three weeks in, you get, you get a kind of try before you buy. And then around about the third week, we have what's called census date, And that's where you've got to commit. After census date, um, that's really where you've got to kind of decide, okay, I'm going full-time or I'm going part-time. And Claudia will go into that in more detail later. Um, so there's a number of different things that we include there, and we really encourage that people think that through. Um, you know, the six hours of personal study really helps you um, to do well. That's, you know, and it's, we're not necessarily looking at, you know, 90% there, we're just looking at you doing well. Let's have a look at what the, how the program is structured. And I won't be reading through all of this. I've got them up there. So do feel free to just read through some of these units as we sort of move through them. Um, this is starting in a February intake, um, what we'd be looking at um, and, as you can see, there's the four units. I haven't got a lot of detail about them, but if you're interested, you can go to our website and that gives us a little bit more information on what those units actually consist of. We've already heard from David, who was talking about foundations of psychology. Um, and then we've got um, Steph and you're teaching person-centered counseling here, and you're also teaching ethics and para um, ethical paradigms and philosophy here. Um, So that's your first year program full time. This is full time. This is the second year program full time. Um, as you can see, we 
in first year we had research methods and statistics one we've got that at number two uh, we're going to talk about statistics because that usually scares the bejeebies out of people um so i want to i remember when i did it it scared the bejeebies out of me it's it's actually not as bad as it seems but we'll talk about that in a minute um, so we've got a good mix here of um, some psych units and some counselling units. Stefan, you're down for teaching this unit in mental health and you're going to be drawing from both the medical model as well as the recovery practitioner model, is that correct? Yeah, yeah. So the medical model as well as different models that um, different, uh, so psychopathology is a medical model's understanding of it, but there's a, uh, in counseling and in psychotherapy, uh, there are different models or they think of, they think of it differently. So they don't uh, think of it as psychopathology. No. So I'll be looking forward to teaching that too. Yeah, that's, I really wanted to emphasize that, that even though we've got that word there, um, where actually the unit is a lovely mix yeah, you, you can see how you can see our reluctance. It's even difficult to even pronounce that word sometimes, <laughs> uh, because but, it's yeah. uh, it's 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 sort of uh, it has a, a weight Definitely. behind it. Uh, yeah, and it. Jenny and I are both trained as as counselors and psychotherapists, so uh, especially for us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that's where both of us have the same um, drawback. However, having said that. Um, Stefan, you're, you're going to balance it up. So it will go through the DSM. It will talk about um, the medical model because it needs to. It will also talk about, the, I would say, the recovery model's really relevant there because that's a mental health model that looks at pathology but also looks beyond pathology and looks at the whole person. So it's a unit, and this is just the beginning, really, of that conversation. Um, you'll see here in semester two, we've got this assessment processes that deepens that work. Um, so um, this psychopathology unit is actually a counselling and a psychology unit. And the assessment processes unit is um, more as counselling unit, but it's certainly the information that we cover there will really deepen um, your ability to respond to crisis, your ability to do um, treatment planning, your ability to do risk, um, you know, risk analysis. So all of these skills are really important to psychology as well. Um, so there's some lovely synergies there. We've got group work facilitation, um, as well as some of the more um, sort of uh, psychology units like cog psych. Um, we've got um, a third year program here. Again, you'll see that we've got research methods and statistics. Here is the counselling placement. Now, this one here, this is a preparation unit. So what we do in third year is rather than give you another counselling unit, we actually give you this preparation unit, which really draws together your skills in the pre that you've learnt in the previous two years, not just counselling skills, but your assessment skills, um, your treatment planning skills, your ability to kind of, um, I suppose, conceptualise what's going on for the client and be able to respond to that. And then in semester two, so this is the last um, semester for full time, as it will be your last semester. If you're part time, you'll do this unit in your last semester as well. We're looking at the counselling placement two, which is off site. Now, um, with counselling, um, we've got some slides for that, so I won't talk too much here. But as I said, that you've got a choice really. Um, you'll be working closely with the um, placement coordinator. They will ask you what you're interested in and they will show you what um, our placement partners, what you know, who are our placement partners. Then usually what happens is you write a resume with guidance from the, um, from the placement um, coordinator, you will submit that to one of those partners. And it's competitive against your peers. It might be that if quite a number of students want the one place, that's okay. If you don't get that place, you don't have to panic. You just have to go to the placement coordinator and the placement coordinator will look for another place that's there. 
and will guide you in that direction. So there's a lot of one-to-one -one conversations happening between the student and the placement coordinator that focuses where you might need to go. So that's all I'll say about that for the moment. We will return to that topic of placement in a minute. So part-time, so if you're interested in doing part-time study, there is some flexibility with this. Um, but this is the program that we usually come forth with. If there's something that you needed to change or wanted to do a little bit differently, um, then you come to talk to me, you, uh, the course coordinator, and I would be able to guide you with that. So as you can see, it's two units, um, four units across the year. And yes, you do start with psych and you kind of start with this, but um, ethics is a lovely grounding place, which um, kind of gets you thinking along the lines of um, professional practice. Our ethical unit covers both the APS, so the Australian Psychological Society, so their code of ethics, as well as PACFA, the Psychotherapy and Counselling Federation of Australia and their Code of Ethics. And if we keep moving through, um, you'll see here um, that this is still first year units, but second year of study, that this is where we sort of more begin to focus on the counselling units and then second semester is a little bit more of psych. Um, and then um, there's a number of different units there in third year. Uh, we then begin to look um, at uh, sort of looking at um, our fourth year, which is sort of a sort of still second year. Um, lovely mix of subjects there. And then this would be fifth year. And then this would be your last year. And as I said, there may be a little bit of flexibility in um, where you put your focus. Um, but we don't have electives in this course. So you will be doing these units, um, but feel free to approach me and, and we can have conversations. If for example, the units that you're meant to be doing part-time are on a Wednesday and you haven't got Wednesday free that semester, but you have got Friday, we might be able to work around that a little bit. Okay, now the three units of statistics. Yes, there are three units of statistics. And sometimes this can, um, it depends on where you're coming from. Sometimes this can elicit feelings of fear and in other cases it can be joyful. Um, and I really mean that. Sometimes people really love that idea of getting their hands into the research part of it. I wanted to show you a quick video, um, which hopefully I'll be able to do with fairly easily. Um, this is a video with Chris um, Kilby, um, who is our, um, he's actually a lecturer into the program, but he's also our Associate Head of Teaching and Learning. Um, and I've got to just say that Chris is wonderful. Now, of course, I'm biased, but um, the feedback that we receive from students tells the picture that um, quite a few of our students felt quite nervous and you know, worried about how they'd go in this unit. And it would be truthful to say that there were times where they weren't really sure whether they were gonna pass or not. They never had to worry, really. They, they emerged with distinctions and high distinctions. And I would say that that's because Chris takes you very gently by the hand in that first unit and leads you through it. And then we've got Joe Brooker teaching the second unit. And, you know, Chris is likely to come back and teach the third unit. And these are beautiful educators, really highly experienced and kind. And I think that's what we need, isn't it, sometimes, is a bit of compassion. That's one of our values that's um, sitting behind us on the, on, the, um, uh, on, on the screen behind us. So um, I just want to um, I just want to check um, maybe can I just check um, Claudia with you? Can you see this screen? Can you see Chris? Yes. Okay, I'm going to play it now. Hi everyone, my name is Chris Kilby. I'm the associate head of school, and I coordinate the first year statistics unit in the bachelor's program. I'm so sorry that I couldn't be there in person with you tonight, but I did still want to send a message through and say hello and greet you at least virtually. I also wanted to 
spend just a couple of minutes talking about statistics in the bachelor's program and some of the um, sometimes we can feel quite anxious or nervous about studying statistics and so I wanted to just share a few um, I suppose pearls of wisdom that I've learned from students that I teach but also my own experience going through statistics. Statistics is an important skill for ensuring that you understand the way that we conduct research, um, not just in terms of being able to um, analyze data that we get out of, our, um, out of our different studies, but also because by understanding statistics and the research methodology that goes along with it, we learn a lot about um, the ways that we can get uh, empirical and non-empirical evidence. Uh, for what we do um, when we're helping different people, be it uh, through counselling, through psychology, or through some other, other channel. So statistics is actually a really important skill to have. And studying statistics in an undergraduate um, degree such as uh, this one will actually mean that you uh, are going to receive a very thorough training in statistics. Now that can be a bit scary. Statistics has numbers. Numbers often brings with it a lot of nervousness. And what I wanted to take the time to explain is that statistics, even though there are numbers, it's not actually a math uh, in the sense that you're not going to really have to be calculating equations or um, calculating stuff by hand. There are numbers you need to know how to interpret those. Um, but at no point we're going to ask you to do long division for example, or something like that. We use some mathematical principles, but we walk you through those we hold your hand. We make sure that it's very comfortable and we only use those where we have to. Otherwise, statistics is more of a philosophy. It's more of an art, it's more of a science, but it's not really a math. Um, you're not going to see numbers being used in the same way. The way that I like to think about it is that statistics is how we ask questions of the real world using numbers and how we then determine the answer to those questions. We're simply using numbers to represent arguments. That's all that we're doing in statistics. So it's not like studying really hard trigonometry or other fancy kinds of mathematics. You're going to find that statistics is a completely different ballgame. I sometimes like to share a story um, particularly with students that are very anxious about their math ability um, of when I was studying. Now, you'll hear me say plenty in our classes that I might be a statistician, but I'm not a mathematician. I say it a lot. I don't trust my own ability to do math, and I'll always have a calculator if I need to do something. And that was true when I studied statistics. I didn't have a strong mathematics background. But I had a friend who did. Um, they actually were one of the top students in their high school for maths. And they, they didn't fail statistics, but they got a very, very low grade. And I came out one mark off getting a HD, getting one of the highest grades that you can get. And that was a really turning point for me when I, I did actually realise that this isn't about maths, um, that maths really doesn't matter. It's so much more that goes into it. It's the decision-making processes. It's the philosophy, the understanding of what we're doing and how we're using numbers to express arguments and ideas. So I'm hoping that helps to maybe quell any of the anxiety um, or fear that you might be feeling around having to study statistics. Um, and if anything, maybe empowers you a little bit. Statistics is actually a very approachable topic if we can put the anxiety aside. Um, and, and either way, we can work through that. And the classes are designed to help you work through that. We start off very slow um, so that you have time and space to become comfortable. Okay, I think that's everything that I want to say about studying statistics here at Can Miller. Um, you'll do both quantitative, so looking at actual numbers, but we also do qualitative as well, um, which is looking at text. Okay, hopefully I'll see you, um, at least some of you, if not all of you next year in class, and I hope that the rest of you are like as well.
We do have clinics. We've got a clinic at our Hawthorne East campus. We also have a clinic in North Melbourne and in Dandenong. And there is sometimes our students will um, be placed in those clinics, but more often what we find is that um, the counselling placements actually work quite well out in the community. So we've got a number of partners. Some of them are high schools, um, some of them are primary schools, some of them are um, community clinics in the, in the community. Um, we've got a wide range of different places where someone might work. Um, and you're well supported. We have you given a clinical supervisor who is from Ken Miller. You will also have a placement supervisor and uh, you undergo regular supervision. So normally that would be one-to-one -one supervision each fortnight for an hour and group, super, uh, group supervision alternating every alternate fortnight. So that will be a small group of you coming together and doing group supervision. So we go way beyond the supervisory um, minimum requirements that PACFA set. Um, and essentially- Can I, can I just butt in here? Just uh, talk, talk about the placement is that this will be the first placement of many that you will have in your, uh, if, uh, when you decide to uh, study further, uh, if you decide to study further. So, um, it, you know, if you're interested in things like uh, forensic or working in a hospital or anything like that, uh, that is probably more better suited for your master's, de uh, master's degrees. Um, this is the, uh, given that this is your first placement, we want you to start off easy. Um, something where, where you'll have quite a, a, a good experience and you'll feel, um, the, the idea is to consolidate the learning, not to not to open up and, and sort of scatter people. So um, well, this is why, uh, yeah, so this is the first of many. That, that's a really good point. It is a really good point, particularly if you're interested in psychology, this will be the first of many, but even in counselling, if you choose to go on and do a master's, you'll get placement there as well. And this is a counselling placement. So we, we and as, as Stefan rightly said, we're really looking at you consolidating your learning here. Um, rather than making it a really stressful experience. Um, allow about one to two days per week above your contact time. Um, the placement unit is a unit. So um, when you're doing placement, if you're full-time, you'll be doing another three units. If you're part-time, you'll be doing another one unit. Um, but I would allow at least one to two days per week for the placement. Um, anyway, that, that's something that you'll get a much um, stronger feel for when you come on board. We have lots of um, conversations between placement coordinations and individual students. Career pathways, I think we've pretty much covered. Um, and this diagram just looks at if you want it to become a counsellor. The bachelor course at the moment is under, um, it's, it, we're about to apply for PAC for accreditation and um, potentially ACA accreditation. So PACFA is the one of the peak bodies, the Psychotherapy and Counselling Federation of Australia. And ACA, the Australian Counselling Association, is the other peak body. And it, you, you don't have to be a member of both. You can be a, a member of either or. And when you're a member of either one of those, then um, that brings you to the RCAP register, which is the Australian Register of Counselling and Psychotherapists. So if you're a member of PACFRA or you're a member of ACA, um, most levels will get you through to that RCAP register. Um, ideally, though, they do want you seeing clients. So when you graduate from this bachelor pending PACFA registration, and ACA registration, and I haven't got a problem. I actually think we will probably get we will get that because we're this is Ken Miller's expertise. It is just that, like like with many programs, you've got to start running them before you can get accreditation. It's not something you can get before you start running them, and it's often a nice idea to get through the first year 
um, with PACFA because then we've got all the data that we can give them. So we're in that sort of position at the moment. But once you graduate from the Bachelor of Psychology and Counselling, you would then join PACFA, let's say, as a um, graduate member. Um, if you're seeing clients, then you get listed on RCAP and you can get employment um, or go off into private practice. It's quite a simple kind of um, kind of a trajectory through. Um, and then if you want to go further, furthering your study, you certainly can do that. But this is what I call level one counselling. Doing a master's is what I call level two. It just goes that little bit deeper and covers the units in a little bit more depth. And then when we look at becoming a psychologist, this, um, this always amuses me and kind of cracks me up, but we, it, it's quite seriously, it can be this complicated. So I'm gonna just quickly guide you through it. A three year program in psychology is not enough to be a psychologist, Watch it, but it is the beginning point. So we have already got um, APAC accreditation, we're pleased to say. So this course is accredited by APAC. Um, it, it, so that's your first three years of the journey towards being a psychologist. If you then wish to, you would then, if you wanted to continue that journey, you would then, now you do a fourth year, it's an, it's an APAC accredited fourth year. What we run at Care Miller is the Bachelor of Psychology Honours. So we've got an honours program at Care Miller. If you get 70%, average across your time in the bachelors you will get you will just automatically get accepted into that program and then it's up to you whether you choose to do it or not um, but um, you know that may not be the path for you but it, it could be the path for you um, and if you stayed at Camilla, then you do your honours program and then you could move into a master's and this is where it gets a bit complex because Camilla runs quite a few different masters it's, I won't go through the master's programs here because that's not really for tonight, but you'll see that Ken Miller also does doctors of psychology as well. So we, we sort of, we have a PhD program and we have a doctorate program. So essentially, if you wanted to, you could kind of just do the whole journey. To become a psychologist though, you need this, these three years, you need your fourth year, and then you need two years, the fifth and sixth year, to be a psychologist. You do not need to go on and do a doctorate. You do not need a PhD, but you do need an APAC registered um, masters. So this might be a clinical masters or it could be a masters of professional psychology. Or if you're interested in another field like forensic or organizational psych, you might be able to do that fifth and sixth year somewhere else at another institution. So after the fifth and sixth year, after successfully graduating from your master's, that's when you become a full psychologist. So it is a full-time journey of six years or part-time equivalent. Okay. So just how, what are the entry requirements? The entry requirements are for school leavers, an ATAR minimum of 65. Um, we, we go through VTAC, as Claudia is going to walk through in a minute. Um, and I guess the important thing to keep in mind there is that if you've had anything that's really disrupted your study, which I need to say during times of COVID, um, you know, if there has been something that's significantly disrupted your study, then there is a, um, there is a, a form in the VTAC application where you can tell us about that. And we will, we will adjust things to keep that in mind. There is um, a written response, which all applicants need to fill out. It is basically about five or six, well, actually less than that. It's about three or four questions, which add up to about 400 to 500 words. And from that, um, we just, we look at that and that's the beginning to make sure that sort of what we're offering is, is likely to fit you. And that, that um, we'll also have it, we won't make our decision on that as such, there's always a conversation that comes after that, um, sometimes just because I'm interested to hear more about whether this course could be the right one for you. And sometimes it might be to just chase up on certain elements of that. Um, for mature age applicants, 21 years or over, if you don't have an ATAR, don't panic. 
Um, you can still um, register through VTAC as Claudia will go through, um, but, um, and you don't need to do an interview. You do still have to respond to the questions. There may be cases where we will set up an interview or normally what I'll do is I might um, organise a phone appointment or a Zoom appointment where we might have a bit of a chat. And again, it's just to make sure that what we're offering is what you want and, and answer any questions. Um, I've, at the moment, I've been doing that with everyone just as a kind of question and answer because we want to make sure that you're in the program that you want to be in. Okay, so applications. This is for you, I think, Claudia. Yes, thank you. Thanks, Jenny. Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, as Jenny mentioned, my name's Claudia. Um, I work in admissions as well as um, student administration um, alongside Saffron, who's our academic registrar, and Anne, who's our deputy, who you might have already heard from um, previously. Uh, so we're the faces behind the emails that you will receive should you decide to apply. Next slide. Now, before I go on, I, met, I must mention that I am not a whiz um, in the admissions process. I am actually filling in for Anne today um, as she's unable to, be, to, to make it. Um, so I do ask that any personal questions, so personal by personal, I mean related to your personal situation, um, you know, do I apply through VTAC or do I apply directly, um, uh, special consideration questions, things like that, I will put our email in the chat. So I do ask that you email any personal questions to our email so that it's one, secure, and two, you do receive the correct advice from a, a VTAC officer, um, who is Anne. In saying that, um, the basic information applications for first round offers close on the 29th of September at 5 p.m. and that's via VTAC. So you may have already not, uh, been aware that uh, all applications must go via VTAC. That is our main form of receiving applications for this course. Um, the only exception for that uh, is if you're an international non-year 12 student. So if you're an international student who is not leaving year 12, then you must apply directly to Cam Miller. And if that applies to you, then um, feel free to email us and we can kind of talk through that as well. It's a very easy application process, as Jenny mentioned. Um, the only exception is that you are asked to fill out those three or four uh, more personal questions um, directly through us. And all of that information is on the VTAC course page as well. Now, orientation. Um, orientation is usually a full day, which you are oriented to the course, you meet all of the staff, you meet your peers. Uh, it's an amazing day. We have, um, you know, different activities, usually on campus, fingers crossed. Um, and yeah, we'll just spend the day meeting each other, kind of getting to know the course on a different level. And yeah, just getting to know each other. And orientation is usually held in mid-February. And that date will um, be confirmed as soon as we know exactly when we're going to host it. Classes begin uh, the week beginning the 20th of February. And I posted a link to our academic calendar in the chat earlier, and I'll just refresh it now. So that you can actually see the exact date that classes begin. Thanks, Jenny. All right, I think this slide may have been left out um, with the other entry requirement slide, but I'll just breeze over it. Um, that link at the top, which you will receive the slides sometime tomorrow, um, the link at the top actually links to our course page on our internal website, on our Cam Miller website, and that really clearly outlines the entry requirements for each group of individuals. So I would recommend going and having a look at that. Um, because yeah, it's the clearest kind of outline of the entry requirements that you can get. Thanks, Jenny. All right, tuition fees. So you're probably wondering, how do I pay for this course? Um, we do have a number of options, which is great. 
So because we are, uh, we're not supported by the government, we uh, do not receive any government funding. Um, we do offer fee health loans, which it's a little confusing, but if you're if you're familiar with Hex Health, which is the government funded, uh, sorry, the Commonwealth supported um, loan scheme, then fee health is very similar. It's for providers like us who do not receive any government support. Um, just think of them as basically the same thing. Uh, you receive a loan and you pay off that loan once your income reaches a certain threshold. I would recommend having a look at the study assist website just to kind of choose whether fee health is the, the, the right option for you. Uh, there is another uh, company that provides student loans called ZFI. Uh, I think they were formerly called study loans and that they're a private provider. So I would recommend um, getting independent advice for that. Or you can apply, um, or you can, sorry, pay upfront or direct to us. So we accept FPOS, bank transfer, credit card, um, cash even, completely up to you. Thanks. All right, so I'm gonna go through a couple of our facilities and services that we offer. This is our foyer in our Hawthorne East campus. Um, as Jenny mentioned, it's a very open, airy building. It's beautiful. It's usually buzzing, a lot busier than the picture. Um, and I'll go through a couple of uh, facilities that we offer in Hawthorne East. Apologies, I'm just getting over a sickness. So if I mute myself, it's because I'm coughing. <laughs> Um, all right, so you'll see the top point there. Canvas is our learning management system and my CMI is our student website. These are accessible anywhere in the world. Um, of course, you'll be uh, in, in Victoria, most likely, uh, but you can access these programs from anywhere at any time. Cloud-based programs. So, you know, if you've got your laptop with you and you forgot to submit an assignment, you can jump on anywhere in the world and submit that assignment before the due date. Um, second point is a dedicated library, psychology and counselling. So our librarians will mention to you, you know, um, our library is small, but it's mighty. And um, we do, the reason it is small is because we're not a bigger university that needs to offer, you know, accounting resources or business resources. We only have a library dedicated to psychology, counseling and psychotherapy, which is amazing. Um, and the library is open um, during business hours for you to just drop in and study in or borrow books from at any time. All right, free Office 365 account, um, which is, you know, your Word, your PowerPoint, Outlook, uh, OneDrive, etc. Research software, including Quirkos and Qualtrics, which you probably won't touch until your statistics units, if any. Um, IT support, we have a really great team of IT professionals who are there to help with basically any IT matter you can think of. Student parking, we do have limited spaces, uh, free student parking, um, and we will go through that process once you're admitted into a course. Study skills, um, we do offer constant study and learning support throughout the semester, throughout the academic year. And they are offered by various professionals, including our librarians or our learning support uh, advisor. And those workshops are offered nearly weekly, uh, if not monthly. Counseling support, um, another great addition we do offer uh, various forms of counselling support for our students and we encourage the use of those. So um, you'll learn more about that if you are admitted into a course, um, but just know that we uh, we do support you in that way. Careers and registration advice, um, like Jenny said, our staff are all in, you know, in the profession that you're working towards, hopefully. So um, we're always here for careers advice and registration advice as well. Some of our staff are actually on boards of registration uh, bodies, for example, PACFA, ACA, APAC. So we can usually provide um, really great advice. 
Peer mentoring is another um, great service that we offer um, that just involves, you know, some of the more um, advanced students in courses offering peer mentoring services to students who are just commencing a course. And finally, Student Kitchen, um, they're like it to mention. You can um, bring your own lunch, chuck it in the fridge. We've got free tea and coffee and milk. Um, and finally, a small dedicated team of experienced professionals. And just reiterating what Jenny said, all of your teachers, um, you know, they've been in your position before and they are professionals. So you're, you're receiving top-notch um, education at Kemua. Thanks, Jenny. I'm not gonna go through this, I'm not gonna play it, um, but when you receive the, fly, uh, the slides, feel free to go through and watch our virtual tour of our campus. And I think this is one of the last slides. Um, so like I said, if you do have any personal questions, um, please feel free to send it through to applications at caremiller.edu.au. Um, I think Jenny, you're welcoming emails to your personal email as well. Um, so yeah, if you do have a question that's more related to the course, then feel free to uh, email Jenny directly. Otherwise, if it's in relation to VTAC or uh, admissions, applications, um, documents, things like that, feel free to direct to the student admin team um, and we'll usually get back to you within one to two business days, if not 10 minutes, um, so yeah. Fantastic, thanks so much, Claudia. Um, thanks, Jenny. Because we are a small institution, we can't offer the range of extracurricular activities that a large university offers. Um, that's, that does become a little bit difficult. But I guess what kind of we do offer, um, you, know, in a, you know, sort of in lieu of that, is that you've got often smaller groups and then we support um, focusing on what the group might like to achieve or, or that what certain students might like to achieve. So I'll give an example of that. And this actually isn't in the bachelor's because the bachelor is a fairly new program. Actually, I could give you a bachelor example um, where some of the students are sort of getting together and spending some time and, you know, they've, they've done really well working on projects together and, you know, we took them out for lunch. Um, so it's a much more sort of intimate thing. As far as um, other interests go, um, look, we've had some students in the post-grade area that, um, you know, may have, um, you know, been interested in a certain area of study and may have wanted somebody to talk to them about that. And so we've actually organised for that person to come to Ken Miller and, and talk about that. We don't promise that we can always do that, but that's an example of what we've done. We've got a very active um, diversity committee too that includes students. So if you're interested in sort of becoming more involved in how diversity is responded to on campus, um, we welcome your, um, you know, sort of coming in and, and being involved in that. There's another program too that we offer, which is that peer mentoring program that is really about leadership skills. It isn't a peer mentoring program, it's a leadership program. And so you don't have to join that, but if you're interested in joining that um, at the beginning of the year, that opens up to applications and um, that gives you, um, I, you know, it gives you two things really broadly. It gives you experience in, um, in leadership, but it also gives you the training in how to be a good leader. Um, we also have a symposium program that I guess is more intellectual now that I think about it, but it's where speakers come and they come on different days of the week. And um, they, um, you know, so for example, if you're in on a Wednesday, you might find that twice a month or once a month on a Wednesday, we've got um, somebody talking about, who, who works in the profession that might be talking about, um, you know, Alzheimer's treatments or um, how to work with um, depression or, 
Uh, it might focus on a particular area of, um, of, of practice. And students just come with their lunch and sit down and sort of really, um, they can get a lot of those a question and answer. And some of them are excellent. Like some of them really go into quite depth, you know, in depth. We always, Claudia, you'll be able to help me with this. We've got them online, don't we? So that if you're at home, you can also link in from home if you're not on campus on that day. Um, I'm trying to think of what else we do. We do um, barbecues every now and again, you know, for the students, um, particularly uh, around orientation, but also sometimes towards the end. We've had to kind of step back from that during COVID, but um, I think we're probably getting to a point where we'll be able to start them up again. Um, and there was another sort of uh, program too that I was just, it just split it through my head too. Um, but yeah, we've, we've started up a shut up and write group, which for those of you that aren't familiar with that, it sounds a bit um, awful, but it's full, you know, it's actually a focused study time to write. And that was actually the initiative of some honours students. And we've supported them with that. Fiona, our um, wonderful um, uh, student support person, um, academic support person has set them up and they're great. They're just fantastic. So what we can't offer is kind of the larger um, kind of, um, you know, that there's this interest group and that interest group and this interest group. But if you, but what we find is it's a bit more organic than that. If a group of students are really interested in something, we will try and support you with that. And then there are also institutional run programs that we open up to students to attend for very less, you know, like $20, sometimes $30 rather than full price and some of them are free. Um, yeah. So I think that might be almost the end of it. I don't think we've got any more question and answer coming through. Anything that we haven't got to tonight, um, send us an email and we will make sure it goes to the right person and they will be able to get back to you. I just want to thank everyone for attending. Um, and I'd like to thank um, Claudia and Stefan for, um, for helping out.